Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Truby, and I serve as the uh, director of the Emerging Scholars Network. And uh, we're hosting this special conversation tonight on finding mentors. We have heard in the past from a number of our ESN members that finding good mentors is a real challenge in many cases. And we're going to be talking about that tonight and uh, what we mean by mentoring, where we find good mentors, and what makes for an effective relationship between mentors and mentees. And uh, I'll be introducing our guests uh, who will be sharing with us in just a minute. Uh, a couple of very wise folks who have a lot of experience in academia, and I'm looking forward to our conversation around mentoring. Uh, first of though, first though, uh, let me stop our share here. Just a few things about our call tonight. Um, you know, uh, this this work this call is being recorded. Uh, if you prefer not to be recorded or photographed, you, please keep your mic muted and disable your video by continuing to participate in the conversation with your video and or audio enabled. After the recording begins, you're consenting to allow InterVarsity to use the recording and any screenshots of our conversation for InterVarsity ministry purposes, including a posting a video recording for online for asynchronous viewing. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording for just a moment uh, if you want to adjust your settings and uh, touch on a couple other things for our call tonight. We'll introduce our, our speakers for tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, Julie Dahl is a faculty associate. Uh, uh, Julie is a faculty associate uh, and directs the Continuing Studies Language Program at the University of Wisconsin. She's been teaching language to adults for more than 30 years. She's the author of the Logros curriculum used in uh, University of Wisconsin's Spanish program and also teaches intercultural skills. She's lived abroad on multiple occasions and genuinely loves the work of training people to cross barriers uh, by growing their language and intercultural skills. Uh, she is also the spouse of an InterVarsity staff person, so she knows InterVarsity grad and faculty ministry very well. I think there's actually a meeting in their home later tonight. Um, secondly, uh, Jeff Harden uh, is also at the University of Wisconsin as a professor of cell biology, developmental biology, genetics, and genomics. Uh, his lab uses the C. elegans embryo as a model for investigating cell movement and cell adhesion during embryonic development, uh, understanding how cells move and how they make and break adhesions has important implications for understanding birth defects during human development and for understanding cancer regression. He's the senior author of a widely used textbook in cell biology, The World of the Cell, and a co-editor of The wa uh, Warfare Between Science and Religion, The Idea That Wouldn't Die with Johns Hopkins Press. Thank you both for joining us tonight on this ESN conversation. Good to be with you. Yep. Yeah, Pleasure we're to glad, be here. Yeah, we're very glad to have you with us. Well, anyhow, uh, to kind of kick us off here, one of the things we talked about when we were setting up this conversation was just what do we mean by mentoring? How would you define or describe mentoring, at least as you've experienced it? Yes. Oh, you asked me to go first now. Okay. okay. Well, okay. Um, so I think when we were thinking about this particular question, I think the thing that immediately comes to mind is that uh, sometimes people have an, a mental image of mentoring as being this incredibly formal um, kind of interaction where you're you're meeting weekly or biweekly or something like that. There's this very well-defined agenda and uh, kind of working out expectations for the mentee and the mentor. And, and there are those kinds of mentoring relationships where a mentor is providing advice and guidance and even sometimes pushback with the mentee and hopefully the mentee is reciprocating in some ways in that relationship but i think it's much more common to have less formal kinds of mentoring relationships mm -hmm. 
And uh, these form for a time uh, and they can be crucially important at critical junctures in one's career. And uh, then they naturally perhaps uh, those those relationships either progress or sometimes they they dissolve and and uh those mentoring relationships that are like that those are those are i think much more common for many more of us and uh so for me uh, mentoring when i've been on the receiving end has has been uh, a relationship with someone who has some sort of expertise that i don't have who can help me to grow in a particular area and uh, that means that in most situations, there's not a one-stop shop for mentoring. Mentors have different expertise in different areas. And so mentoring relationships are going to involve relationships that um, might be fairly specific, professional, spiritual, uh, relational. And um, so, for me, th those kinds of um, mentoring relationships that are, they're kind of multiplexed mentoring relationships. Those have been much more common for me throughout my career. Mm -hmm. Now on the, on the giving side, as a mentor, clearly I mentor a lot of graduate students in a direct professional kind of, of setting. Um, but I also mentor uh, undergraduate students and um Christian graduate students through uh, being a faculty advisor to uh, the Graduate Christian Fellowship here at UW. And in those kinds of relationships, uh, mentoring is usually not so formal as I laid out at the beginning of, of uh, my comments. Instead, it's uh, mentoring relationships arise according to need, proximity, and opportunity. And uh, that's that's really more how I view uh, the mentoring process and, and mentoring relationships. Hmm. Julie, what would you add uh, to that? Yeah, I would very much agree. Thanks, Jeff, for uh, for for taking the lead on that. Um, I'd agree that I think if I look back in my my past too, like who mentored me in places where I felt like I had a mentor role, that I'd agree most of the time it was we didn't call it that. It was much more informal, right? I, it wasn't like where there was this agreed upon, will you be my mentor? Yes, I'll be your mentor. Um, I think that doesn't happen very much. So it's, I guess our first challenge from both of us is probably think about expanding what we mean by that to being, you know, sort of any time that someone with experience, more experience, more expertise is invited or naturally goes into a role of like influencing, directing, guiding. I've kind of been thinking about that. One thought I thought of is like, how is this different from a friendship? Right. There's definitely the trust, you know, element there of a friendship, but I think it's really important there's a distance that you don't have in a friendship. And that's I think what allows this relationship to have a unique role. Um, there's trust, but also the person is is distant. And so that I think gives them the authority and to to speak. Um, more freely than sometimes we do with friends. We tend to think we're the most open with friends, but oftentimes not. We don't necessarily speak the words of challenge and critique in a way that we should to friends. And so I think you need a certain amount of distance in, in a mentor-mentee relationship for the, the person, the mentor, to be able to, to sort of speak into your life with authority. You know, I wonder if we make a one. You know, that's you've raised an interesting <laughs> point, Julie, and I, I wanted to ask you both about um, people who have mentored or influenced you at key inflection points in your life. And, and Julie, I wonder if you might lead off and maybe kind of expand a little bit, of, you know, of, of some examples of people who've spoken into your life. Interesting. The, the first, instantly when I think about that, there's two elderly women who were in my small town where I grew up and were in my church. They um, taught in my school. And our, our places of overlap was all over the place. They were my Sunday school teachers at different points, teachers at different points. One was the grandmother of my of a really good friend of mine. So, And another one mentored me more formally as a writing coach. Um, so it was really interesting because they overlapped in my life in all sorts of ways. And so I could sort of, I could think back that very often they spoke into my, part of it is I think they were, they were very godly women and they saw themselves as, as that being part of their job, right? To guide and lead. 
um, youth. And then they just had so many opportunities because in a small town, you overlap in all sorts of areas, right? Um, but I, I think I'd look back at that, you know, first of all, they had my trust and they had this amazing, both, they were both scholars, even though they're, you know, never went to um, grad school or anything like that, but, but incredibly knowledgeable women. And um, so I, I think I looked at them as somebody who I wanted to learn from and they were willing to take mm -hmm. that role. Um, and then I kind of look, you know, as I look through my life, oftentimes, you know, it, it was um, people that I met in respect, the trust was there because I had met them through church, right? Um, I would say there was, but in co undergrad, there was professors that I knew were Christians and um, I would say mentored me, right? More in terms of thinking about how do I think about school? Mm -hmm. Do I think about how do I think about grad school? And I was able to go back to them, even if I had been away for a long time, go back and, you know, when I was thinking about grad school and, and contact them. Um, living abroad, I lived abroad for um, quite a bit of time. And there too, the people who mentored me, some through work, but mostly it was through church. And I think as I look back, I, again, I'm going to come back, keep coming back to that trust element, right? And also mm -hmm. I think a responsibility element. Um, the church hopefully is instilling with a, in us a responsibility to look around and not say who can I, not just who can I learn from, but who should I be trying to guide? Who can I steer and help? I actually have something I have more expertise, I have more experience, and I should always be asking myself, who could I be helping here? And um, so I think a lot of those relationships happened organically. And as I've been thinking about this, one thing I keep coming back to is how do you position yourself in a place where you are physically present with people you want um, to learn from? Or the, or the opposite, are you physically present with people that you ha have something to say and you could speak into their lives? Hmm. And then, sure. because a lot of it happens organically, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeff, how about yourself? Well, I, so uh, earlier I said, I think that mentoring is, is multiplex mentoring is the way many of us have found mentoring to occur so that means that uh, some of my mentors have been kind of special grace spiritual mentors uh i i think back to when i was an undergraduate thinking through my career decisions and um i was a leader in a student christian ministry as an undergraduate at michigan state and um I interacted with the, the campus director of the student ministry and uh, he was not an academic, but he came alongside me and tried to understand who I was. And he did two things. He asked me questions about how I was thinking about the direction of my life and, and my future and how was I asking God about that. And then um, he also modeled things for me. Um, and he, he talked about things that were helpful for him to develop his walk with God, things, ways that he could be quiet long enough to have a sense that the Holy Spirit might be speaking to him um, and, and helping to direct his life. And, and those were lessons that only came through, uh, significant interactions with, with this man. And uh, so so that's one really formative example. But I also had uh, mentoring uh, experiences that I would call mentoring by common grace. And that's to say that wise people who are not believers, but who nevertheless mm. have wisdom that ultimately comes from God. Um, um, and uh, you know, my PhD advisor was like that. And um, so he, I, I think, just interacting with him regularly helped me to understand what it means to be genuinely fascinated by my research topic and to be not just fascinated by it, but to be uh, filled with enthusiasm and, and fascination. For, for what I was doing. So um, now I, I have to say that uh, that second mentoring relationship 
my my PhD mentor was not. Oh, sorry about that. My my mentor was not um, very. What do I want to say? It was hard to pin him down long enough to have significant interactions. So I had to figure out for myself how how to do that. And I realized that I I could go for a walk with him. I went to UC Berkeley uh, as an as a graduate student, and I we were on one corner of the campus and I picked a, a, an espresso cafe that was as far as possible away <laughs> from the lab. And we would walk there <laughs> and back. And in that space, we were able to share life together. And so, so that was on me to figure out a modality that made sense. Um, but then, uh, you know, that was an incredible blessing. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I hear some great things about, about trust, uh, about, good questions about uh, just life on life kind of connections here that begin to develop uh, and so forth. You know, you've mentioned at different points, um, you know, particularly being attuned to opportunities to be mentors. But I think for many people, uh, you know, they uh, who are on the other end of it, uh, they haven't found necessarily coming somebody coming knocking at their door, or showing up in their life, wanting to be a mentor. And, you know, part of the question is, uh, do you just kind of wait for that to happen? Or what responsibility does somebody who would like to find a good mentor or find some mentoring around particular inflection points in their life or whatever? What kind of responsibility do we have as mentees or potential mentees? I mean, that's a great question. Um, I I think sometimes there is a sense today, perhaps, because mentoring, the mentoring as a buzzword is just mm -hmm. in the air we breathe today. There's an expectation that mentors are just going to show up on your doorstep. And, you know, sometimes that happens. And that's great if it does. But I know in my life, I've had to seek out mentors i might already know them but um i i've had to seek opportunities to ask for the kind of mentoring and advice that that i need um they might not think it's their role to step in and offer their their services somehow mm -hmm. um and so uh you know when i was uh an assistant professor i I talked to actually the the man who was the original author of the textbook that I'm senior author of now. It's called Becker's World of the Cell, and and uh, that's named after Wayne Becker, who was a he was a Christian faculty member in the botany department here. And uh, I got to know Wayne through a um, a program where we were asked to pair up with. Um, a more senior faculty member. It was funded by the Lilly Endowment to help assistant professors develop cohorts that whereby they could encourage one another as teachers. And so, but you're supposed to pick an older guy. And so I thought, ah, this is a great opportunity. I, I so I chose Wayne, thinking that yeah, he would fulfill his obligations to the Lilly program with a plum. You know, that's not an issue, but. But thinking that that would be a, a stepping stone to developing a more thorough relationship with him where I could pick his brain about, okay, how how should I be a Christian pre-tenure? How should I think about my visibility as a Christian on campus? What kinds of spiritual dangers are there out there that I need to be on guard against? Um, how do I work in the family piece, you know, the church piece, the campus ministry piece. How do I think about all of that? And um, Wayne and I didn't meet often, but, you know, that that was a, a tremendous opportunity for me. So so that's an example of kind of a, a carpe diem moment, you know, seizing the opportunity as it presented itself uh, as, so, so there was kind of a, a, a formal reason to set up the relationship. But then it, it morphed into something that was a bit more organic. And then eventually I ended up being on the same author team as him. So that led to new ways for him to provide mentoring for me as a, as a, a youngster trying to get into the textbook business. 
which is not for sissies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've, I've had a few friends who've worked on textbooks, and you're right. Uh, and it never ends once you get involved, it seems like. But Julie, how about yourself? What What's your sense about the, you know, the responsibility of mentees in terms of initiating a, a, a mentoring relationship? Do you wait for a mentor? Probably not. I mean, it, hopefully if you, what you know, what we said before, you can be push, placing yourself in situations where you're going to be interacting with people who, you know, could speak into your life and you're giving them permission. But, but there are probably a moment where you're going to have to be more proactive, like as Jeff was saying. And something that in our original conversation with the three of us that, that came up over and over again is, is, you know, being realistic that people feel overwhelmed, they feel stressed. So how do you make it easy for them to say yes, if you're going to say, you know, so first, what is it you, you really are looking for guidance in? I think if you go to somebody and say, will you be my mentor, that can, could feel very overwhelming. You know, what do you, what do you want me to help you with? How long is this, you know, what's the, what's the, the commitment here? So maybe making it easy to, for them to say yes, right, which is, I have one specific question or two, you know, I was hoping that you could, you know, I'd like to talk to you about X, or why, right? And um, and then, you know, start out as just maybe one, the commitment small, right? Could we meet once or twice to discuss this? Um, you know, can you give flexibility? And, you know, hopefully there could be something that could grow into more, uh, but maybe make it really easy for the person to say yes and know what they're committing to. And um, I don't know if that's a helpful advice. Um, yeah, yeah. Having a clarity exactly what it is that I'm, I'm looking for. And it could be very different from, as Jeff was saying, like maybe you start with a question that's easy for them to say yes to. Can you talk to me about this? But I also have another question is, I want to talk to you what it's like to be a parent in academia or what it's like to be, you know, um, you know, all sorts of things that then that spin off of that, but maybe start with the easy thing to say yes to that is their field of expertise. We all feel like we don't have things that we we all feel insecure, right? Everybody is yeah. is insecure about what they know and, and their life experience. And, you know, um, so um, also recognizing that they're not going to feel confident saying yes to everything. Yeah. 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 I, I interviewed somebody a while back who talked about wanting to, they, they were making the transition from research to teaching in the university and, and they hadn't had a lot of experience in teaching and really felt their inadequacy in this and uh, found some people who they thought were really good teachers and just said, I'd like to work with you on my teaching. Uh, and I, I wonder if I could both observe you and if you could observe me. And it, it was a very specific ask. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, where do you find mentors? You know, we call this, we call this seminar uh, Finding Mentors. So where does one look? Well, that's a great Julie? question. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm up. Am I up? Or no, Julie, are you Please up? go, because I'm no, thinking, no, oh, no, gosh, no. I don't know what to <laughs> Over to you, Julie. <laughs> I don't think I have a good answer for that one, because, uh, you know, it'd be nice. There are formal channels, right? There are formal channels that, that connect, um, you know, especially when you start a new job. There's a lot of departments. Um, even many of you maybe have faced this in coming in as a grad student in my program when I first started as a grad student, it didn't exist, but it was something that they added that they would pair um, grad students who'd been there for several years with with incoming grad students. And I did that. And um, and a couple of times I felt there was a really good connection. I feel it was very helpful to the younger grad student who was coming in and we hit it off and, you know, it, it sort of forged into a friendship. And then there were other times that you know, I met once with the incoming grad student and they, you know, never contacted me. <laughs> they didn't feel like I had that much to offer. So, you know, sometimes those can work. It's probably worth a place to start. But again, is how do you, maybe you're going to have to take some risks that are outside of some of our comfort zones because it isn't always naturally going to happen that there you, it's easy to find. Here's a list of people that maybe I make an effort as their way that I can get to know, um, someone in my church better, a, a faculty member in my department, a colleague who's farther down the road in this profession than, than me. And um, maybe it's inviting them out for coffee and and it's something more informal to sort of get to know them a little bit and then make an ask. And again, I think it might be a, a specific yeah. small ask that hopefully could lead to something bigger. Jeff, what can you add to that? Well, I, 
I think um, the best mentoring interactions are, or, are organic. And I think that uh, during the pandemic, doing things organically became very hard when you're Zooming all the time and um, every everybody feels very disconnected. That just that made it really tough. Uh, let's be honest about that. And I think there were a lot of barriers to developing organic relationships out of which mentoring might arise. Um, to me, the the biggest barrier to developing important relationships is self isolation. It's just easier for me to keep my head down and go to my office and do my thing and go home and and not really have meaningful interactions. So meaningful interactions require effort on our part. And especially if there's a verticality to the mentoring interaction where you're 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 looking to uh go outside your own demographic, your age demographic um to someone more senior than you or in conversely you you interacting with someone more junior than you um so you know i have found trying to go out for lunch or coffee with people and seeing which relationships seem to have more momentum than others as a kind of a pre-filtering exercise super useful so yeah I, you know I, just getting to know people is always valuable and uh, then sometimes you you find relationships where you realize, wow, that this could be really fruitful if I hang with this person a little more. Um, in terms of explicitly Christian kinds of relationships, um, church can be good. I, I I go to a little campus church where there are there a significant fraction of the people in the church are on the campus, but in many churches that's not going to be true. And so um, to me, if I want to be salt and light on the university campus, I need to be around people who understand that campus milieu. And that means that I need to seek out people either on the campus who are kind of peer mentors, something we haven't talked about in this call so far, mm -hmm. who can spur me on to greater faithfulness or people in, or in more senior uh, higher seniority demographics than me, uh, whose brain I can pick, but not just whose brain I can pick, um, whom I can ask about what it means to be a faithful Christian on the campus. And so for that, you kind of need to be involved in Christian, explicitly Christian fellowships on the campus. I think that's why I've spent a lot of time with campus ministry organizations. Uh, we have a faculty staff fellowship and um, Julie and I have been a part of that, and uh, some really significant relationships have come out of that. Right now, I'm meeting with someone who Bob and Julie know, a guy named Terry Morrison. He used to be the director of faculty ministry nationwide for InterVarsity. He's in his 80s, and I'm trying to soak up his wisdom. And, um, you know, there, there's just no substitute for someone who understands the campus, understands my life, and tries to speak into it. Hmm. Hmm. Well, it's 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 interesting that you mentioned Terry. Uh, Terry hired me to work with InterVarsity, and so we have a long connection. And uh, Terry has played some of the same kinds of roles in my own life. So, shout out to Terry Morrison here. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, I'm going to ask one more question, and I'd invite people in our audience. Uh, we want to transition to some time where you get to ask some questions too, and. Uh, so maybe you might be thinking about what question did I come here wanting to ask or what question has been spurred by our conversation. Maybe jot something down and or jot it in the chat and uh, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. Um, it, the other thing I just wanted to ask you was how do you once we're in a mentoring relationship like this, how do you make the most of it? Uh, how do you, how do you make the most of that relationship, uh, whether it's you know, you've mentioned different kinds of mentoring relationships, peer mentoring relationships, uh, spiritual mentoring relationships with people in a church or other Christians in your institution. Uh, 
there are, you know, there are advisors can be a form of mentor as well. How do we make the most of these different kinds of relationships? Am I up? I don't remember who's up. Yeah, I, think you're, it's my, I think it's my turn. Go for it, go for it. <clears throat> so I, I think that's actually a hard question, Bob. And the well, reason I, it's I, hard you know, I, is I, I, I think- I, I was just gonna give you all softballs, but I throw- I thought, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. Well, you know, I think there's a tendency to want to over-prescribe these kinds of mentoring opportunities. Yeah. And I want to caution against that. You know, my my wife, Susie, is an incredible exemplar of what it means to not overly script uh, what we would call peer mentoring relationships, or the Bible just calls deep spiritual fellowship times. Mm -hmm. um, so there needs to be enough room for unplanned side conversations because sometimes those can be really fruitful on the other hand if there if you have no plan at all uh if you have no goal well you'll hit it every time right so you i think we, we need to have intentionality in our mentoring relationships but i think um at the same time i want to hold them loosely enough that it allows for uh divine unplanned input in that relationship and so um so as julie said you know often i've had a couple of specific questions but then things go well beyond those initial questions and um so i think to make the most of of those mentoring opportunities um it's always helpful to have something to prime the pump but it's also helpful to be a listener and um at ease enough that you can let the the conversation and the relationship develop naturally and not try to force things it's mm -hmm. like good advice i think one thing i might add to that um you know, just summing up, I think not having unrealistic, you know, making sure you're not having unrealistic expectations, which I think is just saying what Jeff did in, in different words. Um, but also, you know, are you preparing your heart? Because sometimes you can think it, it could go hard, right? It's not going the way I want. Am I praying? Am I investing time in praying for, about this relationship um, so I can have realistic expectations? But but also maybe it's going so well in the sense that we enjoy spending time together that we're not having... Um, I'm not creating the space for it to hear critique, right? And so that would be one thing I want to bring up is be sure, if you want to make the most out of this, am I am, is my heart open to hear the answer I don't want to hear, right? Um, that, you know, the advice I don't want to get um, and making sure that our spirit is is open to that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, because that's when the relationship's really, mentoring and relationship's <laughs> really going to, you know, help is when we're getting both encouragement, but we're also getting, um getting called out on things that we're doing poorly or doing or doing wrong. Yeah, I'll just follow up on what Julie said, which was outstanding. I So I have a little bit of an interesting past. I did a Master of Divinity degree before I did my, my science PhD at Berkeley. And I was assigned to a church to work with the college Sunday school class as a seminary student. Well, there was already a leader of that group who was also at my seminary. And he was a year ahead of me. And um, he, uh, I was, well, I had an attitude problem that needed adjustment. That's all I will say. I was, I was too big for my britches. I was pretty impressed with myself. Mm. And uh, I wasn't really aware of it. I was insufficiently self-aware to even know that I had a problem. And so uh, I'm telling this story for a specific reason. Um, this, uh, this, this, friend uh, eventually said, you know, I want you to look up these scriptures. And he just handed me a piece of paper with these scripture references on it. And they are all about how, what should my spiritual response to those in authority over me be? And I was like, oh, he just, he just nuked me because I, I realized the Holy Spirit used those scriptures to reveal my problem to me. And um, 
So I think one of the things that was important there was that um, he was using, he was allowing the scriptures to speak into my life in unique ways. So one of the things that they can be incredibly valuable in Christian mentoring relationships or interactions is that people speak truth into my life by allowing the the scriptures to speak truth into my life. It's mm. a great story, Jeff. Thanks. Yeah. Well, let's um, we'll transition into uh, some question and answer from our audience. Uh, do any of you have a question that you'd like to ask Julie or Jeff about? And you can either put it in the chat or we're small enough here that we can, you, you can just raise hands and unmute and we can talk. Well, I would say that while people are thinking, um, Glenn, did you have something? No, okay. Um, you know, the uh, one of the other things is uh, I, I wanted to ask about that we haven't gotten to is when do you end a mentoring relationship? Is there, you know, you, you know, you talk particularly that, um, you know, these are not necessarily long protracted relationships. When, when, when is it? When do you end a mentor, mentoring relationship? How do you know it's time to do that? Um, that's that's a good question. Um, so if, you know, we talked earlier, if you've just asked for something small, right, can we meet a couple of times, you know, then, then it, there'd have to be something where one of you extends, right? So let's imagine that that happens and it's going well and you start meeting regularly. Um, you know, again, some of this is organic, right? Things probably come up. And and I guess I was thinking, thinking from the side of the mentor, right? Can you always make it easy for them to not feel obliged to, to keep something going, right? Thinking about their time and respecting that. Um, and, it, and it could happen the other way as well, right? That the, the mentee has things come up. The hard question would be, what if one of them wants to break it off and the other one is signaling just the opposite, right? Mm. How do you do that graciously? And um, and that one thing I thought of earlier, and I, I forgot to bring up, is is I would say too, can you always make sure that you're you're being grateful and that you're showing gratefulness? If somebody's investing in you, right, making sure that you're not taking for granted that, or making them feel like this is just naturally their responsibility, right? Recognizing that they're giving you a gift of their time, and and being intentional about expressing that right mm -hmm. Looks grace like uh, did you have something grace uh, if you, you unmute there uh, there we go thank you bob um yes i was wondering if you distinguish between being the initiator in a in a mentoring relationship and uh, being the recipient. And by that, I mean, by definition, does the invitation to mentor come from the mentee? Because you, you shared, both of you shared really well about um, how to make it easy, um, how to approach uh, someone about mentoring. So I was just wondering, is that the assumption? Well, I, so that's a great question. I, I would say often that is the assumption that, that that there's a verticality. So there's somebody who's up here and somebody down here, and maybe you're that somebody up here sometimes, but maybe you're this person down here at other times. But as you can tell, I'm I'm mature. I, I've been around. Uh, I've been on the faculty here for 32 years at Wisconsin, and you know when you get to be in my seniority level your interactions, um, I have a lot of peer interactions with wise men and women who can help me to be faithful as a Christ follower on the campus. So 
I know we don't normally use the word mentoring for that kind of relationship, but at least in the honors biology program that I've been associated with for about 30 years, that it's called BioCore here, uh, we have a peer mentoring program. And the peer mentors are not really, I mean, they're a year ahead of the people they're mentoring, but that's it. So it's not like there's a huge gap there. And so I know for me, especially as I've, I've gotten older, those kinds of relationships are pretty precious where you're, you're interacting with someone you respect, but they're not really maybe that different in age or seniority from you. So mentoring can be um, maybe it's better not to define it in terms of sort of social categories or other kinds of demographic categories and more along the lines of I see something in you that I think God can use in my life and and that means that uh, sometimes it might be someone actually who's younger than me whom I'm asking advice about so Bob mentioned teaching for example that's a great situation where someone like me I'm an old dog hard to learn new tricks so, but there are people younger than me who have been exposed to different ideas from me and I need to learn from them. So that's a mentoring relationship, even though it seems like an inverted one. So, so I think that can be true um, within the people of God as well, that there are people who you see as having, wow, you're great at evangelism and thinking about evangelism all the time. I'm terrible at that. Like I, I can do it, but I'm not naturally drawn to seek out evangelistic opportunities to tell me about that and that might be someone who's younger than me hmm. and i think there's more that you could add to that too in thinking about like when i think as christians when we have a position of authority or especially supervision or we have been in a position for more time we should sort of always be looking at at people who are coming in new and don't you know maybe d disoriented in the sense that you know they they everything's new in asking what is my responsibility here and, and maybe they're not asking me to be a mentor but i'm in a natural position to sort of offer assistance and i think we have a responsibility to be looking for that and so sometimes i think the, the mentor um, should be the person initiating um, but also recognize maybe the person doesn't want you know there has to be a grace about about this i, I I'd be willing to to get together and talk to you about X. I've been here for a long time. Or um, if you, I think that's our responsibility as Christians. And that mm -hmm. even, you know, grad students, even, in, you know, people don't look at themselves as old enough to be a mentor, right? There's always somebody that you could be speaking into their life or guiding and you have something to give. And we should sort of be making that a habit of it as we look around us, who can, who should I be offering to help before they even ask? I mean, they're definitely, I will say, there have been times when I have sought to be a stealth mentor, which is to say, I'm, I'm just looking at someone, you know, it's like uh, Priscilla and Aquila with Apollos, you know, he's this great apologist, but he's got some things he needs to learn, right? So they take him aside, the book of Acts says, and, and help him to be more effective. And maybe he wrote the book of Hebrews, we don't know, but I'd like to think that he did. And um, that was the fruit of that. And there have been times when I've seen somebody and like, okay, I'm not, I've got lots of areas where I need to learn, but I feel like I could help this person. And, but I don't, sometimes it's not the best strategy to come in with guns blazing saying, I am your mentor, you know, that that's mm -hmm. just not a good strategy. And so simply reaching out in friendship, but seeking to, to help a, a person in areas where maybe by God's grace, you've got some strength and they are maybe not so strong. You know, I, I that has worked for me in, in several situations. And uh, I'm sure people have done that to turn the tables. They, they've done that with me too. I'm, I'm certain of that. I'm taking notes here, Jeff, stealth mentor. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've wondered sometimes whether it's really the case that God ha has placed people around us who can really serve in those roles. And part of it is maybe our being open to that or aware of that. Sometimes I, I know at certain seasons of my own life, I've probably been more, I think I've got it pretty well together. I don't really need that. 
you know, or I'd like that, but I also am pretty self-sufficient. And I'm, am, am I really open? Am I really looking for that? Because I wonder sometimes if God positions people uh, in mm -hmm. our lives, if we are really open to that. I, I really have appreciated this conversation, especially looking at looking at mentoring in terms of stewardship of yeah. the experience that God has given us, but then also considering could God have placed X around me or Y because God wants to help me develop in a particular uh, area. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I wonder if, you know, one of the things is really be an openness to God. Uh, you know, where is God, where is God providing that in my life? Where might God provide that? Other, are there other questions? Is Glenn, Glenn, did you yeah. have a question? I've always had around me a small group of key people since I started in the ministry in 1992. Whenever I have, in that moment, I kept those people in my, in that role until I left the denomination in 2003. I remained in touch with them. Most of them are gone. But in each new phase of my life, I, I ministered outside of my home for 11 years, and then I moved back home and reinvented myself. For every change in my ministry, I have had a group of five or six people. Even now in retirement, in my writing ministry, I have six or seven people that are my core. Uh, they have mentored me, but we haven't ever called it that. Uh, but they know that they have done that, and I know that they have done that. And I've always been able to select the people who can speak into my life, both in the short term and the long term. The current one that I think of now is my cell group friend. There's only two of us, but he's 10 years older than me. And he's starting to talk about things that will come later for me that are current for him. And mm. those kinds of things are really helpful. And we meet every Friday at 9.30, we've done that for eight years. There isn't anything we don't know about each other. And uh, we've been there to the wall when he had his heart surgery and I had my serious dehydration. We went above and beyond the call of duty in both of those instances to re demonstrate our, our connection and embeddedness to each other. And I wouldn't trade it. Now, at one point, the, the relationship with John was more people, but they, they moved and they passed away and they, you know, left. John and I remain. Hmm. Glenn, that's a wonderful testimony of, of having people around us and being open to their speaking into our lives and our speaking into theirs and the, the mutuality of that. Uh, thank you. I don't so know. Much. I don't know who who offered that to me, I, I, whether it was a course or a person or a comment or a conversation or a book or something, but I've always done that. And it's been so uh, grounding is the word. Hmm. Amen. Well, we've kind of come to our time where we're going to wrap up. Uh, I wanted to kind of give Julie and Jeff the last word here. Last words. Uh, any other parting thoughts that either of you, uh, each of you, would like to share? Julie, why don't you lead us? Lead off. Well, I I wanted to thank uh, Jeff and and those of you who participated as well because I feel like I've I've uh, it's helped me round out what I've been thinking about mentoring as well, like words like stewardship and um, and just how many different ways there are to think about this, right? And the kind of always approaching it, what God, how could you use other people in my life, but how can I, what are you asking me to do in investing in other people's mm -hmm. life? And, and Glenn, your, 
worried about grounding is really good as well. Sometimes we're just looking for a nice little bullet of, of advice and um, guidance and, and thinking, not thinking of us so much as, as the sort of thing that's going to root me for the long term. And Jeff, I think your experience and the stories you've shared have, have sort of maybe gone more in that direction as well. You know, people who um, give me this sort of groundedness and, and um, not just encouragement, but the, you know, help us sort of be steady on for the long road as well. I, uh, I think in, in my case, I, I'm, I'm at an inflection point in my own career. So I've offloaded a bunch of administrative responsibility after um, a very long time, I'll just say that, and um, wrapping up some board responsibilities with a a, a Christian foundation and some other things and creating some space. And I'm, I'm really seeking mentorship about the next step. And so uh, these questions are all very live for me. What, what ought that to look like? Uh, who are the people in my life who can provide the kind of full orbed Christian input that, that I need mm. for the next step to, to be faithful. So uh, these kinds of questions never go away. I think Glenn said that very well. They they stay with you throughout your entire life. And um, our, our circumstances may change. And maybe there's a, a more acute sense that we need that mentoring when we're graduate students. But I can tell you that that is a lifelong process. So strap in and, and get ready for that for the rest <laughs> of your lives. Amen. Amen. That's a good word to end on. Well, th thank you both of you for uh, uh, being willing to kind of share out of your own experience and your insights. And uh, uh, and, and I should mention that uh, one of the things that is just uh, obvious in your talking too is this community of faculty and staff that you're a part of together and the ways that you uh, encourage each other. And any any of you who have the opportunity to have groups like that around you, in your institutions. I, I would just so encourage that. Uh, uh, it's obvious that that makes a huge difference uh, to a number of people at Wisconsin. Um, we just wanna uh, share with you briefly a, a few things. Uh, I'm gonna shift to share screen for a moment here. Uh, we do have uh, regular conversations that we uh, offer in the Emerging Scholars Network. And I wanted to let you know about our next one. Uh, our next conversation is actually coming up a, a week from tomorrow uh, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, 1 central and so forth. Um, we're we're going to be talking with Terry Wildman. Uh, Terry Wildman is uh, an Ojibwe and Yaqui uh, tribal member. He is uh, the lead translator and project coordinator of the First Nations Version New Testament translation that has recently been published by InterVarsity Press. He also has contributed to A Just Passion, a six-week Lenten journey, uh, which is a book that uh, has recently been published by InterVarsity that uh, uh, is available just in time for Lent. Um, and we're going to be talking about his involvement with both of those publications. He is a... Uh, uh, a leadership development director for Native InterVarsity, uh, working with uh, indigenous groups uh, in this country. And uh, uh, it should be just a fascinating conversation. That's going to be at um, two o'clock Eastern time, as I said. And there's a sign up uh, link here that I'll put into the chat as well. Um, in case uh, you'd be interested in joining us. We'd love to have you uh, hang out with us. The last thing I should just mention on just a commercial for uh, the Emerging Scholars Network, which is the host of this conversation. Uh, we are so grateful for you joining us today. And uh, we'd love for you to join us if you've not joined us. Uh, just stop by our website, which is blog.emergingscholars.org. And at the top of the page, there's a join button. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, uh, where we have regular announcements of upcoming conversations and so forth. And we'd encourage you to visit and subscribe to our ESN channel on YouTube. Uh, this conversation will be on that 
uh, channel, and uh, there are about 35 other conversations uh, with a variety of different folks touching on different issues around uh, the academic journey. And so we'd, um, I'd encourage you to visit there and, and subscribe, so, which uh, will give you a notification whenever, the, whenever we post something new. So with that, uh, I want to once again thank all of you for joining us this evening and taking the time out. And uh, uh, thank Julie and Jeff for your time with us as well. And we'll end the, we'll 